Welcome to Sweden in Transition, the podcast that meets change makers in Sweden. Can a burger company be a role model on sustainability? In Sweden, the favorite fast food starts with an M, but it's not the one you think. It is Max Burger, a family-owned company that received UN's Global Climate Action Award at COP25 in Madrid. I am Sonia Lehmann and today I meet Kai Turek, Chief Sustainability Officer at Max Burgers. In this conversation, we will see what a company can do to become not only climate neutral, but even climate positive. We will discuss the importance of changing our food system and our eating habits and debate on how we should go to achieve the objective of limiting climate change below 1.5 degree. Hi Kai, welcome. Thank you very much. The first time we met, you shared a presentation and the headline was Changing our business model to save the world. What do you say to people to stress that we need to save the world? I mean, we have a number of different ways of thinking about that. First, we have human needs that could be around poverty. And we know we have social conflicts. But then, of course, it's also about the planet. We have planetary boundaries. We are transgressing those. And the most well-known way of doing that is, of course, climate change. We're doing that on a massive scale. So UN says it's the largest systematic threat to humanity. So it's not a small thing. So we really need to change. And everyone has to change. A burger company definitely has to change. Our core product for many years have been beef. And we know that has a high climate impact. So how can we develop a new business model that's exactly in line with what society's needs? That's what we're looking at. Before we talk about Max, 1.5 degree is not enough, even, you said. No. Just so we understand, what's the concrete impacts of such a climate warming? What scientists have told us always seem to be too little. We learn all the time that it's more pressing than we thought. But the ideas that are coming up now that if we reach the global goal of 1.5 degree to the year 2100, we will probably have increased ocean surface around the globe with one to two meters. We might probably have something like one billion climate refugees during this century, and we will probably have eradicated one third of all species on Earth. So that is if we reach the goals. So we, we, we really need to reach those and we need to go further than that. What I see is a future where we actually restore the climate. We reverse climate change. So that's what we have in mind. What's the first time you realized that we had a climate issue? How did you come to work on those? It was actually a school task in 1991 in Stockholm University. My teacher said, you're going to present this article to the class. And it was about the greenhouse gas effect. And I was thinking, maybe in the future I need to be part of fixing it. And yet every day since then I've been part of the problem. I've been buying stuff, using stuff that actually destroys the planet. Now today I'm a parent, I got two kids. And being a parent, realizing that your everyday decisions in a way destroys the future of your own children. That's nothing you can take lightly if you really internalize that. We cannot get used to this situation where we're on a constant battle just thinking about how soon will we hit the iceberg on Titanic, thinking that we cannot avoid it. I'm just trying to think about how can we avoid being on Titanic from the start? How can we reverse stuff? What has been your personal and professional journey since this uh, first presentation at uh -huh. university? I started doing some research in systems ecology. Then I realized we probably have enough information about the problem. We need to do something about it. So people need to know about it. So I started sustainability communications. Uh, after this, I've been working for, for many different organizations, both as an advisor when I was at Futera here in Sweden uh, or The Natural Step. I think about sustainability today as partly a physical problem in the world, but also a communication problem. Because if we ask 1,000 people, do you want to destroy the world? I'm pretty sure that they won't say, I want to destroy the world. It's just about a situation where we ended up, we didn't plan to end up here. No one planned to destroy the climate. But of course, people have known for decades that we might end up here and we haven't done anything about it. 
Why did you decide to join Max and to work as the Chief Sustainability Officer here? I've been an advisor to Max from 2007. In 2008, Max did a lot of interesting stuff. First restaurant in the world to put the climate label on the menu so the guests can make informed decisions. They could see a beef burger has that climate impact, a vegan burger has this impact. We started doing offsets, planting trees. So there were a lot of stuff we were doing at that time. And in 2016, Max quintupled the amount of green burgers on the menu, really trying to change the core offering with a lower climate impact. Max just said, maybe there's an opening for you here. I joined. I'm really happy for it. Yeah. So what is so special about what Max has done? If you ask Swedes, do you know any company that takes active responsibility for the climate? 95% will say, I don't know, but 5% will say Max. 4% will say Ikea. Then everyone else is lower. So what have we done to do that? And I think one of the things we've done is exactly the climate label on the menu. It becomes tangible. And we've done a lot of other stuff. Selling more and more green burgers, of course. We've gone climate positive. We've done it for so many years that people are starting to recognize it right now. And I think one reason why other companies are looking at us is that the communication has been fairly successful. People understand this. We're reducing our climate impact and we are really profitable. I think that's inspiring. Otherwise, people are thinking, so you're doing something good for the climate, but your business didn't go well. And we've done both. What do we need to do if we want to become climate positive, if you had to lead us step by step? The first step, which is kind of technical and quite complex, is to calculate the full footprint of the company or for all your products. In technical language, that would be looking at greenhouse gas protocol scope one, two and three. And most companies that are actually doing their analysis is just looking at scope one and two. And for Max in 2017, one and two together was 0.9% of our total footprint. So 99.1% were in scope three. So scope one is from stuff you own. For Max, it would be refrigerants and it would be company cars. In scope two, it would be bought energy. So heating and electricity and stuff. And in scope three, it's everything else. So all the packaging, transports, everything you buy. So all the food, of course, all the beef, the bread, the, and also the guest's journey back and forth to the restaurant and the co-worker's journey back and forth. So, so that's the full value chain. So there are quite few companies that are looking at it. And it's a lot of confusion, too, because if one company is saying we're reducing our own footprint with the 50%, do they mean... Uh, 50% of 1% or 0.9% or do they mean 50% of 100% is confusing right now but I think the right way to go is to look at your full value chain. So that's the first step, analyze everything. The second step is to reduce your emissions in line with the 1.5 degree target from Paris and that actually is the most difficult one because it really means you have to look into your core business at least for max. It's about the things we serve what is the average impact of a max meal? According to WWF here in Sweden, the situation in 2050, when we should go down to one kilo per person a year, it's 0.5 kilo for lunch, 0.5 for dinner, and 0.4 for breakfast. So then we know where we need to be in 2050. And we're at 1.9 today. We've reduced our climate footprint with 22% since 2013. That's the whole value chain. The only comparison figure we've had otherwise is another burger chain that measures their carbon footprint. And they're up to four kilos. So from that perspective, we have half of what they have per average meal. The journey now is how can we reach 0.5, reduce our carbon footprint with 70% and make good business out of that and show the industry that this is possible. Because one of the most important things we've learned over all these years when working with, with climate change and, and uh, burgers is that the most important thing we can do to reduce the carbon footprint is to make sure that the burgers taste well. So taste is everything. That kind of means that our main chef, Jonas, his taste buds are really climate heroes if he's doing it right. What is taste then? Of course, it is a few chemical sensors in, in the mouth and the nose, but more than that is how we think about it. Taste is culture. People like different things in different parts of the world, 
in, in different centuries and so on. Just to give you a really Swedish example of that, in Sweden, a lot of people love sour herring. And it's something that most people feel like they should puke of <laughs> instinctively. <laughs> and if that can become something of a, a tasty dish, we know that taste is culture. How do we make sure that the burgers we're creating in the future, that everyone thinks the one with the lowest climate impact, that's actually the most tasty ones. So it's an interesting journey. To go back to the figures you mentioned, a Swede or a European on average has an emission of CO2 equivalent to 11 ton of yeah. CO2. And we should go down to 1, 1.5. That's the full footprint. Yeah. It includes meals, but it includes everything else. Yeah. Our mo mobility, how we heat our homes. Yeah. And you were mentioning the target of a meal footprint. 0.5 kilo carbon dioxide equivalents per meal. But if you average that over the year, it will be like 650 kilos. So of the one ton you need, two thirds will go to the food. So the housing and other stuff have to go down even further. That's yeah. interesting, by the way, because yeah. uh, one of the things we see since the Industrial Revolution is that food used to be our main budget. Now what we want is a nice uh, mobile phone and to travel the world. To do that, we compromise on food. What you're saying is that in the century we are entering now, food has to take a fair share. It will take it from a climate budget. If it will come from how we use our individual money, I don't know. Right now, we pay a lot for meat. If we want to create one kilo of red meat, we might have to feed this animal 10 or 20 kilo of a plant. What if we eat one kilo of plant instead? You will still have so many kilos of plants that you never had to buy. That means it will be even less expensive to have that kind of lifestyle. If we stay within the same budget, in Sweden maybe it's 13% of your disposable income that goes to food today. So if we stay in that budget and the raw material we use for food is much, much cheaper, so we can really create magnificent meals in the future around plant-based stuff, uh, that's what I believe. We have one species of edible cow, but we have literally thousands of edible species of plants. So imagine those kind of gourmet experiences in the future. Mm. If we go back to the step-by-step -step journey yeah. to climate positive, yeah. you made the diagnosis on where your impact was coming from for Max, yeah. and you realized that most of it was coming from meat. Yeah. How much is that? Today it's 49%, but it used to be way higher. When we made the first climate analysis, it wasn't as big as the one we have today, so they're not really comparable. But at that time it was 69%. So we kind of realized we really need to do something. So when we're talking about changing business model, this is what we have to change. We've also changed our name, a statement to ourselves and maybe to others as well, where we're heading. We're no longer called Max Hamburgers, we're called Max Burgers, because we know there are so many good things you can put between two breads uh, that's really tasty, that doesn't have to have a high climate impact. It is an area where we can really fail and we're really dependent on the consumers here. So if they don't like our burgers with low climate impact, we're losing that customer. Or they're going to choose something from meat instead. So that's why it's really core business to do it. The short target to 2022 is that every second meal we serve should be without beef. We're right now on a little bit more than 40% that's without beef. And we started off with 18% in 2015. But if we look at the numbers of the veggie burgers, that's the lacto-ovo-vegetarian burgers and the fully vegan burgers, the fully plant-based burgers, they start off at 2% of the sales volume in 2015 and went up to 22% in 2019. So that's 1,100% increase in four years. For us, that's a, that's a revolution. That, that's changing the business model right there. And, and of course, it reduces our climate impact pretty fast as well. And the long-term goal is to 2050, our average meal should have 0.5 kilo carbon dioxide e okay. equivalents. And we have other targets as well, but those are our two central ones. And what do you say to those who said, we tried to sell a veggie alternative and never worked? Yeah, we started selling a falafel burger in 2009. It never sold well, so we shut it down in 2012. 
What we did in 2015 different was a number of things. One of the things that happened during that time was that the number of flexitarians, people who want to reduce meat consumption, increased in Sweden. Maybe 70% of Swedes are flexitarians today. Another thing we've done is also to name the burgers differently. So the plant-based burgers we had in 2016 was the barbecue sandwich. Everyone loves the barbecue taste. So that means that when you're a customer, you don't have to think about, am I going vegan now or not? That looks tasty. So many restaurants have first five really deliciously described meals with all the details and just get your juices flowing. Then you have the monthly vegan. Then you're supposed to have your juices flowing for a monthly vegan. It doesn't describe it at all. So just changing the language and how we sell it was also important. So taste come first. Our leading value in the communication was green leaves. Like buy this burger is good for the climate. Instead of buy this burger, it's really, really tasty, what we say today. So the difference might seem small to some people, but it's fundamental. Uh, but then the third, the burgers actually taste better. It's so many things happening around the vegan burgers. And thinking about it like this is we've had the traditional cow burger for at least 100 years. So that's 100 years of business development. The veggie burger, I wouldn't say that's more than 30 years. So we have 70 years that we need to do in a much shorter time of business development. But it's happening around the globe as we speak. Quite a few Swedes today would say that the veggie burgers are tasting better already. So I would say to those who haven't succeeded, try again, do it a little bit better. Apart from this veggie strategy, what are you working on to reduce climate impact? What are the other drivers? We're increasing the, the share of uh, renewable packaging. So we're up to 92% renewable packaging today. Company cars are, of course, exhausting less carbon dioxide every year. We have less than 1% food waste. The restaurants themselves, they're wind-powered since 2008. They're wind-powered in Sweden, but now we're expanding into Poland. So what do we do there? It's, there's a lot of things to do. Most of the things is still ahead of us that we need to do to reduce the impact. Because when I think about fast food, yeah. I'm thinking packaging. Yeah. I think also about location, the whole concept of taking mm. the car to go to the restaurant. Mm. Is that something we can afford in the future, really? Or do we need to rethink even the network of the yeah. restaurant? Uh, good questions. When we're talking about plastics, we're often thinking about that we're spreading plastics into the environment. Generally, that doesn't happen at all in Sweden because we have a, a modern waste treatment system. So the plastic that goes out into the oceans goes from Africa and Asia where they don't have any waste management system. So it just goes out. Uh, in Sweden, it's generally either recycled in material way or burned. Uh, so you get energy out of it. But we're doing that and we're going to continue to go for more renewable packaging. Speaking for myself, I try to avoid now going to restaurants where there is disposable packaging because I'd rather just cut it from the source. We've been thinking about it, but it's, first of all, it's a totally different business model. So if you just go from max to what is called casual dining, you're going to have to wait for your burger four times more and you will pay at least a double amount of money. And, and then you can have plates. It's two different business models like that. But also, since we've done the full climate analysis, we know the packaging is really small. It's still something we need to work on, but we, we need to work on the beef. That's 50% instead of 5%. So we're just focusing on the right area. You mentioned beef. You're going to still have beef in the future. Are there ways to decrease the impact of beef? And are you working on that as well? Yeah, we've been thinking about that for many years. What can we do? And one of the things we've done long before we started talking about climate change is that in Sweden, we only buy Swedish beef. The Swedish beef actually comes from well-managed systems. I would say Swedish beef has 30% less or 50% less climate impact compared to the global average. And also we have strict animal legislations in Sweden and we have the lowest use of antibiotics in EU and so on. So that costs us around 30% more than buying compared comparable EU uh, meat. We need to think about what we can do further to this. We've been a little bit stuck here in one way because we buy such a small part of many cows. We don't buy the Antrico or anything like that. And that means that we have a really small entrance point on any farmer. But I think we might change that. I'm looking for those initiatives where we can reduce the climate impact of beef. And I think without too many measures, we could actually have the climate impact of beef in Sweden again.
My question was about uh, transportation. This is something that we have been thinking about. It's really hard to predict uh, where we should be. I still think we're going to have transports in the future if we just go into that perspective. Maybe those transports were not even be by electrical vehicles, but by maybe hydrogen vehicles. And the hydrogen created from sun energy. So you would have solar panels and stuff and draw it down from the atmosphere. I actually believe that's where we're going right now. Electricity will just be a, an intermediate solution on our way to the hydrogen society. We've been doing these kind of surveys to see where people come from. What we find out is that it's often they have another journey. We're just on the side of their journey. If we're right on the road there, it's just 400 meters. That's my extra journey. But what we've been looking at is that 5% of the footprint comes from the guest's journey back and forth through the restaurant. That's also so interesting when we've done the, the major analysis that we can see some things are small and some things are big when we're looking at the general picture. And I think if we would have just been looking at our small footprint, the company cars and refrigerants and something like that, we would have just taught all our staff to go eco driving. And that would have been what we've done. And But you would have missed the point. We would have missed the point completely. Because again, what's the beef footprint? It's 49% last year. So since we made the big analysis, we can focus on where we do the most use. I always thinking like, okay, the packaging, we need to fix it. But the potential to reuse our footprint there is like 4%. Looking at the food, we can reduce with 70%. You asked me before how we become climate positive, and I just went through the first two steps. So measure everything and reduce emissions in line with the 1.5 degree target from Paris. But the third step is actually to capture carbon. We do that since 2008 with planting trees, uh, mainly in Africa, but also in, in South America. Right now we're going into Mexico and, and Nicaragua. Smallholder farmers plant trees on their own ground. And it's third party verified, it's certified, it follows systems, should reduce poverty, drought, erosion. So have a lot of local benefits as well. So we do that to capture more carbon than we emit. So 100% up, we calculate that, at least 110% down. That's what we mean with climate positive. We're paying for our emissions in some sort. We kind of have a voluntary carbon tax. And also we capture carbon and we do that already now, not later, but already now. And then every year we start working on reducing our emissions. But that will take a long time because the whole society needs to, to change over that time. But the captured carbon, we can buy that today. So that's the difference about what we have within our circle of influence and what we don't. I think the secret to really have a strong, proactive climate work is to do both, both reductions and captures. And that's what we need to do in the future to be able to reach the 1.5 degree target from Paris. And maybe if we can go one step further to start reversing climate change. We're um, almost at 420 ppm carbon dioxide equivalents in the atmosphere now. Before the industry started in the early 19th century, we might have been at 250 or 280 or something like that. Scientists say it should be 350, we should go below that. So we need to do more than just reductions. That's what I think is extremely needed for every company going into the climate work or every individual as well, or every society. We need to do both. There are some critics about reforestation programs. What are the things that are critical to mm. watch out? Because forest is not just lines of trees. It's no. more than that. It's an ecosystem. It's trees that are indigenous and uh, that uh, are there for a long time. Yeah. A lot of species going back. Mm. So how do you make sure that this little tree that you're planting has mm. a long life before mm. it and that it's properly done? It is a really good question to bring up here. We have carbon offsets of many varieties and some have been really low quality, especially when we're looking at it globally. Some, I think, haven't made a difference at all. Actually, a few of them have made the wrong difference. So it, when we're looking at high quality projects, we have the things you mentioned here, like making sure it's indigenous species, not foreign species, making sure that people living in the area are not forbidden to go into the area or social conflict. If you go with certified, third party verified, you know it's going to be there as well. So that's good for a step. 
it should be registered in an international registry and transparently shown also so one credit can never be sold twice like a share it has to be registered somewhere every type of carbon capture has its own challenges but when i look at it from a scale what can we do today to capture carbon i come up with the same conclusion like un does and researchers does what we have today is trees trees and trees. In the future we might have other methods of doing it like BEX bioenergy with carbon capture storage or like a large carbon dioxide vacuum machines, high-tech stuff. It's not here yet. Even though I agree that we have to be really cautious about the way we do carbon offsetting and I would still say right now it is the best fire extinguisher we have. Or, or actually, it is the only fire extinguisher we have. As Greta says, the house is on fire right now. Trees, but also mangroves, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, the but, same family. Yeah, it's the same family, so natural-based solutions. But right now, what we have third-party verified and certified, it's still trees. Okay. But I think in the future, we will have a plethora. I think it's going to be a, a revolution in innovation. We've had big oil for such a long time. They've been some of our biggest companies in the world for decades. What we need in the future is going to be big suck, but in a good way. We need the same size of companies doing the opposite work, capturing carbon from the atmosphere and putting it down again. This is going to be very interesting to see how we can do that. And if we put it up there, we can actually put it down again. We know how that can be done. Right now, the machine we have to do it is the tree. As a leading sustainability company, can you influence and uh, make sure that on one side you're uh, planting tree and on the other side deforestations continue? In, in some ways, we're still on an exploration, just understanding what are the effects from the supplier, 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 all that chain. And I'm certain we, we're not doing everything right. There will come an, another palm oil that we can phase, phase out, something else. We, we've phased out trans fats and GMOs as well. So those things, but these things will keep turning up and we'll learn more all the time. Mm. What are the tips you can share with other sustainability leaders in other companies? I would say dig where you stand. That's probably a old Swedish expression, but it, it's about if you're trying to put your shovel far away from you, you're not going to say get the same grip. Uh, but where you're actually standing, you can do some good work. The metaphor is about what is it that your company is especially good at doing? What is your core competence? What is the meaning of your company? What are you thriving on? What is Where do you stand? What's your job? So if you're a service company, let's say you give advice to stock market. Of course, you can look at your air travel and you can go into digital meetings instead. That, that's all good to reduce your footprint. But it's not digging exactly where you stand. That would be in what kind of advice do you give to the stock market? How would that change climate? So just focusing on what you already have a passion for and are good at and put that into your sustainability work. I think you're going to do amazing stuff at that, if, if you do that. And what do you say to people that just say, oh, Max, burger company, capitalistic company, can't be a driver for good? I hear that sometimes. I think some of the people who are saying that is saying that because they don't like companies at all. So they wouldn't like companies at all to take part of this. The thing is that If companies are not fixing this, it's not going to happen. So first of all, we need to be part of that change. Secondly, it always depends on what you mean with capitalist. So what does it mean? We're a family-owned company. We've been family-owned since, since we started in 1968, above the polar circle here in Sweden. And we, as other companies, consist of people. And people have emotions. And we want to do the right thing. And we want to be part of the solution. But do I believe that a free market will fix the climate? I don't. I think we need politicians that are going to set rules. And what we can do as a company is also give them some political courage. We can say, this is possible. Max have been doing this, so you can start making decisions around that. Uh, because politicians hate doing stuff that's not practical, that doesn't work. But also we need, of course, individuals who take responsibility and we need the civil society. So for me, it's like a dance between a lot of different partners. If we're going to fix the climate, it's going to be a tango and it's going to be at least three in that tango, individuals, organizations and governments.
I think what people mean when they say a company cannot do good, yeah. there are two things. One thing is about governance. How do you do when shareholders just want profit in mm. the short term? But then the question for Max is, do you think being family owned is making it all possible and it wouldn't happen in a bigger group that would be on the stock yeah, market? Yeah, I, I, um, I think stock market companies can do great stuff too if they find the right formula for doing it. And a few of them are really doing that. But of course, it is an advantage. It's an advantage because this family-owned company wants to be family-owned for at least four generations. They've said that. So then it becomes more evident that we have a long-term perspective. And, and I think also there is something that when you're connecting your name and your identity to a company, uh, the family Bergforce who, who started Max and owns it, I don't think they ever want to sit at a dinner table with people and say, my company that I own or that I decide what it should do, it's an asshole. <laughs> they want to be really proud of Max. In a large sharehold company, maybe the CEO is in there three years and then he's going to another work and, and maybe it becomes a little bit more anonymous like that. But many family-owned companies doesn't do anything anyhow. So... So it really depends on what kind of values you want to strive for and where you want to go. But companies consist out of people. That's good to remember. And I think the second thing behind the question is about growth. Is it possible to have eternal growth in a limited mm. planet? What does it mean mm. for a company? Can you design a long-term vision around mm. balance, mm. maybe, instead mm. of... We really growth? need to go into the, to the words again. How do we define growth? I mean, would it be growth of turnover? Maybe that's possible, actually. If it's growth of the use of resources, that's not possible. And I think what we're buying quite a lot right now is dreams. It's dreams of different sort. We're consuming movies. We're consuming ideas. The best things in life are free when we're talking to our friends and so on. So there are many different ways where we can grow or change ourselves and one company can grow and it's actually good for the climate that it does. So for us at Max, if we can serve the meals with the lowest climate impact and with the tastiest burgers, I think it would be excellent if we outgrew the other companies. If they, uh, on the other hand, have an even lower climate impact and, and an even better tasting burger, I think it would be great if they overcome us. I, it's not a zero-sum game always. It, it depends on how we do it. To take some perspective, today, on average, our impact is 11 ton, and we aim for one ton mm. per person of a CO2 equivalent. That's just a it radical is. change. It is. Do you believe we're going to make it? And if we mm. are, how? Unless something really unexpected happens, like a meteorite hits the earth or COVID-21 is extremely bad, <laughs> I think we're going to continue on the course we're on right now. That means that we're actually evolving as civilizations. We reduce the amount of poverty in the world. We, we have fewer wars because that's the path we've been on for 50, 100 years. And every one of us have a part to play. It's not Greta just. It's not a company over there. What can everyone do? If you do just one thing in your life, what would that be to be part of the solution? We can theoretically fix this within 10 years. It won't happen because that's not how leadership works, but we could fix it. We can have a really good life in a one ton per person a year world. The best things in life are free. It's your friends. It's on how you view yourself, living a life where you can participate in society. You can make love. You know, all of these things doesn't have a high climate impact. Maybe we need to believe yeah. it's possible. What can we do to bring this dream to life and make more people believe in it? Mm. We need to continue to do what, what Greta says. We need to listen to the signs. We need to be aware that we're heading to some kind of dystopia. It is a major crisis. There is an urgency in the situation we are. But we also need to combine that with the solutions or the hope. What, what should we do now then? And that could be called the utopia. We need to be stronger actually at both these points. We have a huge problem, but look over here. We have some magnificent solutions. And when we start to think about those solutions, we get our energy going in another way. 
There is a project in the U.S. called Drawdown. You can look at it on the web. What they've done is just to map out what the most efficient climate measures are. So instead of focusing on the problem, they're focusing on the solution. What if we reduced food waste in the world? How important would that be? What if we educated young girls? That, it seems, is extremely effective to fix the climate because it has these kind of effects where they grow up and they don't get as many kids and they part of the society in other ways. There's so many aspects of it. So go to drawdown.org and, and just see what's possible. There's so many things possible. So not only action, even at a small scale, but build a story around it so mm. it can be replicated and grow bigger. For all people out there that feel that they like to fix problems and there's so much job for you out here. So even though it is a situation where we have a problem, there's also a huge opportunity for meaning. Why was I born? Can I do something that's meaningful? I mean, truly meaningful? Yeah, at this time we can. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot to Kai Tarek for this conversation and thank you. If you enjoyed it, please share it or make a comment or leave five stars. It's an independent podcast so that can provide more visibility to it. See you soon. Bye.